Well folks, good morning, it's 10 a.m. I welcome you to the house of the Lord. It's wonderful that we can meet together even if it's an, an unusual way. We are still grateful that we can come into the house of the Lord and worship together. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 85, verse 1 to 2, and then verse 8 to 10. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but that let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Folks, this is the second Sunday of Advent, and it's the day on which we speak about peace, the peace of God. Last week, we lit the first candle, which symbolizes the hope of the people of God of every age who await the coming of a Savior. This week's candle of peace symbolizes God's word in the Old Testament. Most especially, it represents the words of the prophets who foretold of God's intervention in history through the sending of a Redeemer. He would be great and rule his people with justice and power. He would also be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so today we light the candle of peace. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you gave us the scriptures to point the way to salvation. Teach us to hear them, read them, and study them with love and prayer, and strengthen us by their inspiration to hold firm the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we approach Christmas and think about preparing our homes, think about decorations and gifts, remind us, dear Lord, to prepare ourselves to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus Christ. Be with us now this morning, Lord, as we continue to worship in your name. Amen. Just so very few notices at this time of year, not much happening on the church calendar, but just to say that unless we hear otherwise from the authorities, we will continue to meet the next two Sundays as well. Uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we don't have firm plans yet, we just have to see what happens, but uh, if everything continues as is currently, we will probably have a, a carols service on Christmas Eve on the garden outside, and possibly a Christmas Day service as well, and we would ask that you choose one or the other to attend so that we can maintain our social distancing, but more communication about Christmas Day and those services will be sent out in due course. <laughs> Welcome to week two of our Advent series. Can you remember what we spoke about last week? Our Christmas super symbol that we put up in our homes every year? That's right, our Christmas tree. Can you remember what the most important part of our tree is? The foundation. And who is our foundation for Christmas? It's Christ. What was our Christmas tree a symbol for? Our tree was a symbol of hope. Why? Because it is evergreen, always green, just like Jesus is always with us. He is everlasting and eternal, and his love and faithfulness go on and on and on. He is our firm foundation. We can put our trust in him and stand firm with him. And the shape of our tree pointing to heaven to remind us that we don't put our trust in the world, we put our trust in God, because he has given us all our good gifts and he will continue to do so. This week we need a new symbol and our symbol is a star. Do you know who created the stars? I bet you do. It was God 
And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 16, it says, So God made two larger lights, the sun to rule over the day and the moon to rule over the night. He also made the stars. He is creator God. He didn't just make the stars. He made everything else as well. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just create. He also designed how everything should look and how it should work. He has control over all. Now, the star that we're talking about today isn't just any star. It is that very special star that shone over Bethlehem at Christmas time, at the birth of Jesus. This star could be seen shining, but it was put there for a reason. It was controlled by God. The star was used to confirm a prophecy made by God many years ago. The prophecy goes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And you'll find that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. But he didn't just fulfill the prophecy with the star, he also used it to guide people, like the shepherds, and the wise men to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 10 it says, The star they, the wise men, had seen, when it rose, it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So the star performed in a certain way. It had a certain function. It wasn't just any star. God was guiding it. Did you know that another name for Jesus is Morning Star? So just like God used the star to guide the shepherds and the wise men, God uses Jesus, our Morning Star, to help guide us. So God is the creator, but he is also our guide. And we are not allowed to sing. As you know, we're not allowed to have a time of worship, but just so that you can participate in some way, we have a liturgy this morning called Todayim, and the words should go up on the screen. Mike, have you got them there? Thank you. And I will read it, but at every few lines, I'm going to raise my hand, and at that point, you come in and you say, God, our Father, we praise you. Okay, so just watch out for the hand signal. You are God, we praise you. You are God, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. God, our Father, we praise you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. God, our Father, we praise you. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. God, our Father, we praise you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide, you, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. God, our Father, we praise you. When you became man to set us free, you did not spurn the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. God, our Father, we praise you. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. God, our Father, we praise you. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Keep us today, Lord, from all sin. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. God, our Father, we praise you.
Amen. Did you hear the other cool name for Jesus in the verse from Isaiah? It's Prince of Peace. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the song Hark the Herald Angels Sing because we sing it often at Christmas time. The first verse goes, Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Now, why would God have given us the Prince of Peace? Well, because God wants peace on earth. He wants to show mercy to sinners so that we can be friends with God again. But the only way for that to happen was for God to give us the gift of Jesus. Only Jesus can bring us that peace of being friends with God again. But that is not the only peace that Jesus brings. He brings us peace from our anxiety. He can give us peace for our stress because he is with us in troubled times. And he promises that he is with us and he cares about us. When we hope in Jesus and not in the world, we can take a deep breath and trust that God is in control and that Jesus will be our peace. Now today, we said our symbol is the star. So we are going to make star crafts as a symbol of peace. It's quite a simple craft and you'll find all the pieces that you need in the craft pack that we've provided. But if you don't have a craft pack, reach out and we'll try and get one to you. This star reminds us that at Christmas, the Prince of Peace was born given to us by God, who is in control of everything. And this loving God wants a friendship with us. Isn't that amazing? So may God, the source of hope, fill you with all joy and peace by means of your faith in him, so that your hope will continue to grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's just spend a moment in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning that we can set aside this time to worship you and to be in fellowship one with another. Father, we pray at this time in our world's history and our country's history that we would feel you, feel your presence moving over our land and over our universe. And Lord, that we would be able to find our peace in you as troubles rage around us, Father. Help us to find our center in you. And so this morning, may we have open minds and hearts and open eyes and open ears to hear from your word what you have to say to us. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, folk, we won't take up an offering, obviously, during the service, but there are uh, offering boxes at the back in the foyer. So as you go out, if you can just drop your offering in there. That would be much appreciated. We have two scripture verses, two scripture passages today, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. And that's quite deliberate as we see a golden thread come through from the Old Testament to the New Testament about the coming of the Messiah. So we read first from Isaiah 40, verse 1 to 5. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double from all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then we go to Mark 1, verse 1 to 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism 
of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We give thanks to God for his word. You may have heard of a time in history, a period called the Pax Romana, which is Latin for the Roman peace, and it was a time period that spanned approximately 200 years, around about the, the first century, early first century. And it was a period of time in which there was relative peace and stability in the Roman Empire. And this was not a bad thing. It meant there was more prosperity. And if people aren't fighting, there is more opportunity for the economy to, to get established and to grow. However, it was a peace that was heavily enforced by the military. So if anyone didn't do exactly what they were meant to do or what they were told, any kind of unrest or uprising was very, very swiftly dealt with. And those who were in charge prospered under the Pax Romano. Uh, apologies, how's that? Better. Those who were in, in charge prospered under the Pax Romano. But many were oppressed under the system, including the Israelites. They suffered oppression as the Pax Romana was held in place. So although it was hailed as a time of peace, it was a very heavily legislated, enforced, dominant kind of peace. And it did eventually fall apart. It was not permanent peace, it was not perfect peace, and there was not peace for everyone. Now Jesus was born right into the time period of the Pax Romana, as he was born in Judea, which was under Roman rule at the time. And so I wonder if Jesus, on the night before his crucifixion, when he said to his disciples, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. I wonder if we could possibly interpret his words as saying, the peace I give you is so much greater than the so-called peace of the Roman Empire. The peace that the world gives is less than what I can give you. It's possible, of course, that he's not referring to the Pax Romana at all, but however we view his words there, they are significant in that they draw a clear line between the kind of peace that the world can offer and the peace that God offers, and they are so completely different. Because if you think about it, the peace that we try and create ourselves is always going to be inadequate. Think of every peace treaty that's ever been signed at is hours and hours of negotiation and huge compromises from both sides. And so what ends up as a peace treaty still carries an air of tension in it, an air of disgruntlement. And then not all peace treaties are upheld, not all are followed. Even the, the peace that we try and create for ourselves during the, the course of our day and our lives can be so easily broken. A few days ago, I was the first one out of bed, the house was quiet. I had my cup of tea sitting on the veranda, the sun was shining and I felt so at peace. But someone in our neighborhood drives a very loud motorbike and chose right that moment to roar down our road. It absolutely shattered the silence and the peace and I couldn't get that feeling back. So what we think of as peace and how we try to manufacture it is always going to be momentary and fleeting. So it's very useful that we can turn to the Bible and gain an understanding there of God's peace, which is so different to what the world offers. And there's a golden thread running through the Old Testament into the New Testament that carries the promise of peace. Our passage from Isaiah this morning, Isaiah chapter 40, comes at the start of the second part of Isaiah. Isaiah is divided roughly into two parts, chapters 1 to 39, and then chapters 40 to 66. And the first part of Isaiah from 1 to 39 is quite dire in places. It contains many pronouncements about God's judgment 
on Israel and on the nations around them. But it does also include the occasional promise of hope, occasional glimpse into the future. And it's in the first part of Isaiah in chapter 9 that we hear the wonderful prophecy about the coming of Christ. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Most magnificent verse. And there are other prophetic pronouncements from the Old Testament prophets that promise restoration and joy to God's people as he unfolds his plans for his coming kingdom of peace. And the second part of Isaiah that starts with chapter 40 that we read from today is a little different from the first part of Isaiah. It's a little more uplifting. And in our passage today from from chapter 40, the prophet gets a glimpse into the future, into the exile of the Israelites into Babylon, which was one of the most traumatic events for them. The temple of Jerusalem had been destroyed. The Israelites were taken into Babylon. And we see, the prophet sees, that at this point God will reach down at their time of great distress and comfort them. That's why we have these, these verses, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn. Her penalty is paid. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now I want us to look carefully at what those two verses tell us about God and his relationship with his people. Firstly, they tell us that her warring, her fighting, her struggle is over. When fighting is over, there is peace. Secondly, they tell us that her penalty is paid. Her her punishment that she has received is enough. It's enough. It's done. These are people who had sinned greatly against God. They placed their hope and their trust in idols and in places and in other things besides God. They broke their covenant with God, yet they are being promised his comfort. Did they sin? Yes. Did they suffer for their sin? Yes. But does God leave them there? No. He promises them his comfort. He continues in relationship with them. He does not abandon them. Whatever we have done, whatever sins we have committed, whatever consequences we have suffered, God does not leave us there. He has a plan. He has a plan of redemption. And verse 3 of Isaiah 40 transports us straight to the next part of God's plan for redemption. His intervention in history through the sending of a redeemer. And here the golden thread from Isaiah 40 verse 3 gets picked up in Mark 1 verse 3. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The prophecy from Isaiah is fulfilled. Whose voice is it that cries out? It's the voice of John the Baptist, who heralds and announces the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is God's plan for redemption, for peace, for his people foretold of in the New Testament and in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. And it's really significant to take note of John the Baptist's message. What does it say in Mark 1 verse 4? John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we get the feeling from the next verse that there was a real thirst for this because people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. It was such a simple message and people were ready for it. They were desperate for it. Repent, turn from wickedness and prepare yourself for the coming of the Messiah. We don't talk about repentance much. We don't. I think Neil touched on this last week as well. But at some point in your life, repentance is how you came to be a disciple of Christ. And think back to that time, that the peace you first felt when you repented and you knew that your sins were forgiven. There was that absolute feeling of relief as a burden of guilt was lifted. 
And there was the peace that came from turning your back on your old ways, because that is what repentance is, turning from the pathway we've been on and walking with God in His pathway in the opposite direction. It's a reversal in the way we think. It's a reversal in our attitudes and our behavior. Repentance is a realignment of our lives with God's purpose and plan for us. Everything else is fighting God. When we're not aligned with God, there is disharmony, there is anxiety. And this is a message that the Old Testament prophets spoke out time and time again, and I almost feel sorry for them. I imagine them tearing their hair out because it's such a simple message that they're bringing. It's such a simple thing to do, and yet it was met with such resistance. They pleaded with the people of Israel to turn from their wicked ways and repent. The simple message was that in repentance there is peace with God. If you repent and stay in covenant with God, there will be peace. So I came across this lovely phrase, the roadway of repentance is the pathway to peace. Your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. The being at peace with God kind of peace is so much better than anything the world can offer. It's said that we live in the age of anxiety, an age of anxiety, and I, I don't think that our generation has exclusive um, right to say that we live in the age of anxiety. I think every age, every generation, every era has had something to be anxious about. Certainly this year we've had more to be anxious about than normal. But an age of anxiety leads to a quest for inner peace. There are apps to help you find inner peace. There are books to help you find inner peace. There are retreats in the mountains to help you find inner peace. There are crystals, crystals that can help you find inner peace. There are ways of arranging your furniture in your home that will bring you peace and harmony. There's an entire industry out there to help you find peace. But I don't think it was ever meant to be so hard. I don't think it was ever meant to involve so much work and effort because God gives us his peace freely. And more than that, the peace we have with God is not only a feeling. We do, we do have that feeling of peace, but feelings can pass. What we have with God is a knowing. It's a knowledge, a deep and profound knowledge that is permanent, that we are saved and at peace with God. So here we are, assuming we have all repented and are living at peace with God. What does it mean then? What is the worth of that? What is the value of that? What does it mean to be people of peace? And there are just three things I want to mention there. Firstly, even after we've repented, turned our back on our old ways, committed to follow Christ, we still continue to sin. We still continue to do wrong things, don't we? We still need to repent sometimes so we can continue living at peace with God. Second Peter chapter 3 is also one of the lectionary readings for today, the second Sunday in Advent, and I just want to share two verses from there. As Peter writes, What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. That is a tall order, isn't it? And I don't think we should beat ourselves up about how far we fall short of holiness, particularly when someone cuts in front of us in the traffic or is rude to us at the shops. But the main point here is that we, we need to be conscious about building godly characters and living holy and godly lives, remaining at peace with God. Watch out for the sins that will trip us up and continue to grow in holiness. Secondly, as people of peace, we have to ask ourselves, are we living with others? How are we living with others? Are we sharing the peace that we have found, or do we keep it to ourselves? Also, are we living at peace with all of those around us? Are you holding on to grudges or old feuds? Are there people in your life with whom you need to make peace? Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemaking can take many forms, and making peace with old enemies is one of those. 
And then thirdly, we need to understand what it means to be people of peace more broadly in the context of the struggles that take place in this world. We eagerly await the second coming of Christ and we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth and we imagine that will be a time when peace will reign. And of course we look forward to that, but it should not be an escape from the current realities of the world today. We should be setting about establishing the kingdom of God here and now in the way we look after those who are marginalized, in the way we care for those who are victims of injustice, in the way we lobby for the rights of those who suffer and struggle. There's this phrase, rest in peace, that often gets sort of said over someone when they die. We don't have to wait until we die to rest in peace. We can live in peace now. As we follow Jesus, he will show us to live the kingdom kind of life here and now. Loving others, serving others, forgiving freely, sharing with our neighbors, blessing those who curse us, and being the incarnation of Christ in the world today. As we do that, we will have peace and we will spread peace and we will be people of peace that influence the world and bring about God's kingdom here and now. The peace we have as believers is the kind of peace that cannot fall apart as the Pax Romana did. The peace we have as believers cannot be shattered by the sound of a loud motorbike. The peace we find in the Prince of Peace lasts forever. And I pray that in this season of Advent, as we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, that you would be filled to overflowing with his peace and that the world would see. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, make us a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there is doubt, true faith in you. Lord God, this morning we are mindful before you that we do not live perfect lives, but we have found your perfect peace. And because of that, we can live in wholeness with you and with people around us. Lord, we pray that we would indeed be instruments of your peace. We pray that we would partner with you in bringing your kingdom about here and now. We pray that people would see the peace that we offer through you. Lord, this morning there are many of our number who are feeling anxious, where there are many who are ill, many who have concerns. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them. We ask for prayers answered. We ask for healing, restoration. We ask that those who are concerned about their health and the health of loved ones, we ask for those who are concerned about finances, those who are concerned about family troubles. Father, we ask that you would cover them with your peace. Come into their lives, Lord, draw close to them. May they feel you walking right alongside them. And may they be totally and 100% aware of your peace and your presence in their lives. Father, as we go out into this week, we pray that we would be conscious of the peace that you give us that is so different to what the world can offer. And we pray that we would carry you in our hearts in all that we do. We ask this, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We have a song. Um, I think they're allowed to come quietly. Thanks, Mike. Let's go.
control and control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul and Lord is the day The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Folks, may it indeed be well with your souls as you go out into the week. A reminder to drop your offering in the box at the back. We can stand to say the benediction. We just can't join hands. But let's stand and say the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.